is an unspoiled network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering Pan's Labyrinth by Guillermo del Toro, sponsored by Melanie Linares. In this episode, I discussed, I discussed, wow, that was a Freudian slip right there. I discuss a beautiful and disgusting movie. Welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everyone. I am Natasha. And um, this episode is the very first Spoil Me covering a film. So this will be a little bit different. Um, I mean, it's the only the second Spoil Me that isn't covering a book, the other one being Veronica Mars. So I'm really like covering Pan's Labyrinth was kind of a fulfillment of something that I've been like kind of low key wanting to do and check out anyway. Um Melanie asked me in the group for commissions whether or not I had ever seen it. And I told her that it was a movie that I've been curious about and wanted to watch, but avoided because I knew that there were some really upsetting themes in it and that there was torture and things like that, which I am not really great with. And so, it, you know, like I said, the there was curiosity there. I know how many people love this movie and the art direction is obviously a huge draw for somebody like me who went to school for tech theater initially and was very into set design and costuming. And the idea of doing makeup was actually what I started to veer towards. And this movie is real heavy with that, like layered with puppetry and whatnot. So in that way, this movie really, really attracted me, despite the fact that a lot of its design is repulsive. Um, but the fact that I, when I found out that despite this movie not actually taking, like, it's the Spanish Civil War, so it's not World War II, but there's a vibe there, like, that's very, very similar because of the fascism. Um, this was something that worried me because when I watch movies that take place, um, fascism aside, when there's a persecution and torture angle that can get under my skin in a way that I can't shake for several days at a time, um, longer, you know, sometimes, um, 1944 when allies have invaded Nazi held Europe. Right. And so the, this fascist re regime, like the civil war was like kind of depending on Hitler winning, which, uh, spoiler alert, did not happen. Um, but yeah, they were all sort of like loosely tied together in, and, you know, that's clear in the captain's speech about a new clean Spain. Uh, these people who think that we're all equal and that's just not true. Um, and I have to say that some of my concerns about the torture were actually misplaced because they don't really show very much in this movie. Like it's uh, a suggestion, a very start and then camera cuts away. Um, that is not to say that it's not a deeply bloody, disturbing, brutal movie. There is one scene in particular with a beer bottle that was rough. I love that I'm saying that. And Melanie says, I think the face bashing was the worst up front. Yeah, we're our minds are working the same here, Melanie, because yeah, that I think that scene and I'm going to talk about this movie as if you've seen it. So hopefully everybody can cope with this. Um, but one of the scenes that really establishes who the captain is, is they have apprehended a couple of guys who it could be that they are rebels, or it could be that they were just hunting. And he, without warning, takes a full bottle and bashes this kid in the head with it and crushes his face in repeatedly with the bottle. And I think what startled me so much about this was the fact that the kid doesn't even have a chance to scream. He hits him so fast and with so little warning that the kid is dazed before the next blow even comes. So 
this scene, while brutal, also had this sort of surreal quality to it, because you would expect this kind of scene to be accompanied by screaming or at least like a kind of like whimpering coughing sound from somebody, you know, experience. But there's not. It's like he's already been knocked out and is simply still upright as the rest of it continues to happen to him. Um, the actor who plays the captain is frankly unbelievable. And I felt like I knew exactly who he was the moment their car pulls up to this house. He has a smile on his face and is very gallant to uh, Ophelia's mother. But you can see right directly below the surface, even in that instant, that he is a cold, cruel person. And it doesn't take long to be affirmed of that when Ophelia, bless her heart, tries to like do a salute with the wrong hand and he grabs her hand and kind of crushes it and says wrong hand and there it is you already know who he is Ophelia knows who he is I think Ophelia's mother knows who he is but frankly what's she supposed to do right at this point um so the way that this film works is it sort of plays with whether or not you're going to buy into the story that Ophelia is experiencing. Um, and hi, Devin. We have Devin, Rosalie, and Melanie in the chat. Um, it's the one of the very first moments is they, they've pulled over because Ophelia's mother is ill from her pregnancy. And Ophelia puts a uh, piece of this statue back in place and this giant bug comes out of a hole in the statue and it winds up following her home. And right from the start, you can be like, okay, is this really happening? Is this her imagination? Is she telling herself a story? Is this like, you know, her embroidering on what has happened from years of looking back because you're not exactly sure if this story, if we're supposed to be taking it as everything is happening right now in this moment. Um, at least I wasn't sure initially and pretty quickly I start to realize like how this is being framed. Um, so you're given like a couple of things up front, her mother being pregnant and that pregnancy not going well, they're traveling someplace they've never been she has this like weird encounter with this creature that seems to be following her and is clearly magical in some way. And her mother telling her as she gets back into the car, I want you to call him father. It's just a word, which um, really says a lot, doesn't it? Like, and I don't even mean just about her mother, just the whole situation and saying that something is just a word, which really undercuts your acting like it's not a big deal because you clearly know it's a big deal. Um, and obviously her mother is like trying to protect her daughter too, like being like, it's only a word. I don't want you to freak out because you need to be good so that he doesn't hurt you because he would. And I feel like she's aware of that. I appreciate this film doesn't treat her mother like an idiot who doesn't know what kind of a monster her husband is. You never hear her say outright that she knows, but you really get the impression that she is all too aware and is just very careful. And the one time that she sets her foot wrong, telling everybody how they met, she, the fear on her face. I mean, that's really the thing with everybody's acting in this movie is that they can be one way. And the instant that he enters the scene, their posture changes, their breathing changes. The fear around him is palpable. Um, Melanie saying, one thing to note from the start is how the entire story is framed as a fairy tale with Once Upon a Time. I especially like that it's closer to Grimm's than the pretty perfect stories. Yeah, I forgot to mention that, that it, it, the like tale that we're told in the beginning is that the daughter of the uh, king of the underworld, the princess, uh, had always dreamed of being a human. So she came to the surface and the sun blinded her and soon she became ill and then eventually she died but that the king always maintained that her spirit would somehow return. And so the conceit here is that Ophelia is that 
little girl is his daughter returned. Um, so, and when you say it's like closer to Grimm's than pretty perfect stories, it sure fucking is. This is a, an ugly, brutal story. Um, and I have to be honest, I'm not really sure how I feel about it. Like, you know, I I know people want me to, to review things and just flat out be like, I liked this. I didn't like this. And I can't say that I liked this. I also can't say that I didn't like it. I'm, I'm uh, being very honest when I say I don't know how to feel. Because artistically, it's incredible. The acting is unbelievable. The story, I'm not entirely sure of. And the ending especially... I felt a combination of ways about I can't decide if I feel like it was anticlimactic and kind of cheap or if it had ended in another way, would that feel cheaper? Um, so I'm just going to lay this out in general. Um, Ophelia wanders into a labyrinth that is like by the um, gardens of this house. This is like, I think it's supposed to be an abandoned mill and farmhouse um, in the woods. And they've been stationed there to try and take care of some of the rebels that are living in the forest. And uh, the house has this huge storeroom where they wind up holding hostage, basically all of the food and supplies that people need and giving them ration cards to come get it so that they can keep the rebels in the woods from getting any supplies that they need, basically starving them out. And there's a pretty amazing scene with a dinner party where they're discussing the ration cards and this somebody's saying, I'm not sure that's going to be enough. And someone at the table is in the middle of like piling their plate with food saying, if they're careful, it should be plenty as they like overload their plate. It's one of those moments that I was like, that was pretty well done. Um, feels true. And Ophelia, this is kind of her first... Um, her first assignment, because when she goes down to the labyrinth that first night, she meets Pan. He never uses his name. He never says that's his name. She calls him the fawn the whole time. Um, he is an accomplishment. Like the whole deal with his, the way that he walks, the, obviously there's like some makeup happening, but also I've read that they used puppetry um, and there's just a lot. And, and obviously there's CGI there too, like clearly, but he, I think the combo of those effects add to his otherworldliness and creepy gait and the way that he moves to really hammer home that he's not from here guys. And I thought that was so well done. And I like that like his one of his eyes is milky, like his eyes don't match. And um his movements and the way that he like talks and the liltingness of his voice, it's so like quintessential trickster. Um I just really really loved this whole thing and the way that it starts is like when she sees Pan, she's also looking at this uh this statue that is a creature with horns, a woman, and a baby. And Pan comes in and is like, oh, see, that's me. And that woman is you. And she's like, what about the baby? And he just smooths right past on that. Oh, so uh, how are you liking it here? Like, um, so you're immediately going, what's going on here, Pan? You know that something's happening. But, you know, the ordinary girl upon seeing Pan would shriek and run away this girl is made of stouter stuff than you or I. She is immersed in fairy tales a lot of the time. She's already followed a fairy down here that started out as a bug. And she showed the bug a picture of a fairy, said, this is what fairies look like. And the bug turned into the fairy and then led her down here. So to a degree, she's acting on some faith that this fairy is like a good guy, which you really shouldn't because fairies are notoriously not good guys, but understandable. So her first assignment, he's, she's given this empty book. It looks like just like an unused journal. And she's told that she has to read it while she's alone and will be told what to do next. 
So she, when she does get her assignment, she has to go into the hollow of this tree and deal with a giant frog that's basically sapping all of the life from this huge tree. Now, this is like kind of uh, paralleled with the dinner party that I talked about earlier, where she's been given a beautiful dress that was obviously very expensive um, to wear to this dinner party. And her mother is like looking forward to her wearing it and showing it off for the captain and being a good girl. And uh, she goes and does her assignment under this tree in her good dress. And does she take it off and hang it up? Yes, she does. But also maybe don't just don't. I can't describe to you the anxiety you guys because frankly it turned out better for her than I expected getting put in the bathtub and then sent to bed without supper is like best case scenario I thought for sure she'd get a beating or her mom would get a beating um and that doesn't wind up happening her mom is just embarrassed you know but it really frankly turned out better than I expected because as she gets near to that tree she sinks into the mud and her like brand new patent leather shoes sink in like three inches and I was like oh no and then she hangs the dress up and immediately you see like the ribbon the sash from it like go flying after she goes and crawls under the tree and you know that dress is going to be in the mud by the time she comes out which it is um, and I know I'm supposed to be concerned with her, like her mission here, but as an adult who knows what this world is, I'm far more concerned with her, like getting the shit beat out of her by a fascist captain, you know, at the same time, if we're operating with her point of view, she feels like I'm going to need to get the fuck out of here. So if I'm the daughter of this king, like he says, and I have to prove that I'm of stout heart, I will get away from this fucking psycho captain. And she has a time limit. She has to complete all of this stuff by the time the moon is full, which is on only a couple days. So mm, I get it. But like, oh, I can't, I, you know, I can't put it aside how like, I, oh, oh. so she crawls out of this tree. There are these enormous bugs that crawl all over her. And it's the grossest thing in the entire world. She's crawling through mud and is coated in it. And she gets to this giant toad, which is the size of like a beanbag chair. And could, like tricks the toad into completing the task for her. Because what she needs to do is get these three magical stones inside the toad's belly. And then she needs to take that, that, uh, key out of its stomach. Yeah, I can't with this scene. It was so disgusting. Oh my God. Melanie's saying it's not mud, that's toad shit. You know what? You're probably right, Melanie. You're probably right. Why'd you have to tell me that? It's so much worse now. Oh God. Um. So yeah, the toad like licks thinking that it's a bug. She puts one bug on top of these rocks and it goes for the whole shebang. Gets the... uh like swallows the magic rocks and then like vomits out its own stomach in the worst scene ever. I can't who designed this toad stomach that's dotted with bugs and like coated in slime. Who did it? Who's responsible for this? And the key is like, thankfully, on the outside, because I really thought she was going to have to like, slice open that thing and go clawing through all the goop inside to find the key. And thank God it was on the outside. And all she had to do was grab it. <sighs> um, so yeah, sure enough, she comes out and her dress is ruined. And she has to go shuffling back to the house coated in mud and kind of in shock because she that was a really like scary thing that she just went through. And when she gets back to the house, she kind of interrupts Mercedes, who is in the middle of signaling to the rebels in the woods because she's a spy. Mercedes, what are you doing, girl? You're not being that careful. You're worrying me. She gets caught. And I like really thought it would happen sooner. And I thought it would go worse for her. Oh, this like the tension 
of her and what was going on with the doctor was it made me feel nauseous. I was so worried about the two of them. I just that is a hard thing to get me to do. But we saw the fate of several people. And it could have been really bad. And for Miss Mercedes, if she hadn't, you know, kept her knife on her the way that she did, it would have been really bad. Um, so at one point, Ophelia just tells Mercedes, like, I know what you're up to. I won't tell anybody because I don't want anything bad to happen to you. And I like you. But I can't imagine how like nauseatingly frightened Mercedes must have been when she realized that Ophelia knows what's going on. The daughter of the captain, daughter in quotes. Um, oh my God. I would have pissed my pants if the child of a fascist dictator captain was like, uh, I totally am aware that you're betraying my dad all the time. I saw you. Oh my God. That scene just like, I knew that Ophelia wasn't going to tell on her. I knew that. But still, I felt for Mercedes in that moment, like, a lot. Um, So what's going on during this whole thing is that uh, Ophelia's mother is sick. Her pregnancy is not going well. She starts bleeding at one point so profusely, I was sure she was miscarrying. But it turns out it was, uh, like, an emergency, but she had not lost the baby entirely yet. There was just a bad problem going on. And just because of her mother's illness, Ophelia me- misses the deadline for one of her missions. And uh, Pan shows up in her room and is like, the fuck? Lady, come on. He's looking at his watch like, we need to get this going. What are you doing? And when she mentions her mother being sick, he's like, all right, well, here's a mandrake. Put it in a like bowl of fresh milk and feed it blood. And you know, that'll help your mom. I'm very curious about this whole thing, like how this was supposed to work, because what ends up happening, like at first she puts the mandrake in the milk, it clearly comes alive. She feeds it a couple drops of her blood and it's like writhing and squirming like a human baby under the bed. And it seems like a live thing. When she goes and checks on it later, it seems like it's dead. And I wondered, because she doesn't get a chance to uh, feed it blood again, if she did, would it have come awake again? Or was she supposed to be replacing the milk? Because obviously the milk went bad. Um, Or is this how it's supposed to be? Is it kind of alive for a moment at first? And does it, you know, like, um, Melanie's saying, I only just realized last night that the blood in the book takes the shape of a uterus, A plus imagery. Oh, yeah, yeah. Did you not notice that? Because that bleeding, she opens the book and it it starts off like, yeah, the ovaries coming down. And then, yeah, 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 yeah. That was that moment was really something. And she knows exactly what it is, too. So, like, she closes the book and drops it and runs out to her mom. Um, So, um, yeah, the, the mandrake thing, I'm just wondering, was that supposed to actually work? Because, you know. We don't know how trustworthy Pan is at this point. And I wasn't entirely sure whether or not this was supposed to hap- like go the way that he says. Or is the Mandrake supposed to like become a regular baby so that even if she like miscarried, she could pretend she had the baby. And then like after three days, it would turn back into a Mandrake root. You know how like fairy tales are like that. Oh, you think it's a baby, but really it's just a block of wood. Or it just you think it's a baby, but really it's a cat. Like there's so many stories with women giving birth to things that are animals or changelings and fairies stealing the baby and replacing it with something that can trick people for a couple days. Um, But yeah, I'm really uh, wondering about how all this works. Um, Melanie says, I think it's a combination of Ophelia's care and that Carmen gets healthier as the mandrake doesn't shared life force thing. Oh, so you think that her mom was sucking the health from the mandrake and that it was like going still and dying because it was being it was basically transferring its force to interesting. Okay, that's a thought. Um, All right. I like that. So eventually she gets caught trying to feed this mandrake by the worst person ever to catch you doing anything wrong. Her father, the captain, father in quotes. And 
he's disgusted by this and her mother manages to like get between them and be like all right let me talk to her which i wasn't entirely sure that he would like allow that but he's kind of distracted by the uh the rebels at this point so it seems like he's all too glad to let her deal with the child like he's not interested in this right now so he goes and uh, leaves her to talk to Ophelia about how life isn't like your fairy tales, which is super funny because she's like, your fairy tales are all sweet and lovely and life isn't like that. And I'm like, oh, if only you could see her fairy tales, lady, because a goddamn, it is not sweet and lovely. While I talk about how it's not sweet and lovely, I'm going to back up a little bit to the pale man which is what he is apparently called. Holy fucking balls, guys. The pale man is the stuff of nightmares. The pale man is the sort of creature that you didn't know was in your subconscious that comes crawling up out of the dark to remind you that you're still a child, like deep in your heart. And that's what he is. He is the scariest fucking thing. The end. The scariest. Nothing about his design isn't repulsive and horrifying. Ugh. So this whole thing um, is that she has to go down and retrieve this knife that is kept under the care of the pale man. And in order to do that, she has to use some chalk to draw a doorway, go through the doorway. And within the amount of time on the, uh, the hourglass, she has to go use her gold key that she got, open the thing, get the knife and come back without eating anything that is on the table. Now, a large part of me just wants to be like, you deserved to die. Everybody told you not to eat anything. And you just went and ate something, you stupid dumbass. Oh, well, you're dead now. There's a big part of me that feels this way. But also, fairy tales don't work if people always follow the instructions, right? You have to have somebody not follow it so that you can see what happens if you don't. That's the thing. So, eh, so she eats some grapes. Because she's just, I mean, there's not a lot of like fresh fruit where she's at. That's kind of how fascism works is everything dries up because nobody can. So, yeah. Um, So first she gets the knife and she uses her key on a different square than the one the fairies tell her to use, which I think is meant to be the first indicator that she is who they think she is, uh, the daughter of this underworld king. Um, she gets the knife, she's walking back and there are like frescoes on the wall of this creature eating children. And this, like, not only is the design of the pale man itself just frightening, but I found this to be really symbolic. And I'm not entirely sure if this was like intentional or not, but The pale man looks like a concentration camp victim in some ways, like just being pale and flaccid and unhealthy. And there's like this hunger to him. He eats and he's in front of this feast that he can't see. Like his his eyes are in this dish in front of him until she eats something and he gets his eyes like put into his hands and uses them to see. And there's a pile of shoes near there the table like this is symbolism this is imagery from concentration camps piles of shoes and jewelry and you know the remains of victims and there's something here that feels like he represents this hungry death and evil and emptiness and unthinking pursuit. Um, 
it just it felt like he represented concentration camp somehow. And it's just super disturbing. So she eats the grapes. He picks up his eyes and puts them in his hands and puts his hands in front of his face so that he can see. And very slowly, painfully begins to follow her. She's able to outrun him. Like, it's not that she's not faster than him, but the sand in the hourglass is running out and she doesn't get to her doorway in time and it closes. So what she has to do is because once it closes, that wall becomes like covered in like slime and water. So she can't draw a new doorway. I thought she was going to have to turn around and kill this thing with the knife that she got. But no, she climbs up onto a chair and uses the chalk to draw a trap door in the ceiling and just manages to get away before this thing catches her. And it is the most tense scene. Oh my God. This was, this one scene is worth seeing the movie for, frankly. Like this is the whole thing. And actually Owen sent me a message and I have to, uh, cause it was like a screenshot, I think from um, IMDb. Um, Stephen King attended a screening of the film and sat next to Guillermo del Toro. According to del Toro, King squirmed when the pale man chased Ophelia. Del Toro compared the experience of seeing King's reaction to winning an Oscar, which, uh, yeah, I mean, this creature does kind of remind me of some of the shit that King has written about, especially there's a chapter of Dark Tower where a couple characters are being pursued down a tunnel and it's pure dark so they can't see what it is but one of them eventually is able to light a flare and there's something like within like four feet of them covered in eyes and then the light goes out and it's dark again and i'm just like why would you do this to me stephen king so yeah this is very reminiscent of that and um the way that it's set up in this like real ritualistic way with this long hall that has all of the pillars and everything. It's just like somehow adds to the creepiness because it's such a savage creature, but it's in this very formal setting. So it's just not what you're used to, you know, when you think of something like that, you'd think of it being in a cave or something that's really uh, feels savage and lonesome as well. But instead, he almost feels like he's in a temple, you know. Um, and Melanie says, thank God she put that chair through the door when she started. I would never thought to do that. Yeah, well, she used it to climb down. Um, but yeah, like if she hadn't have had that, she was toast. I guess she could have. No, I was going to say she could have drawn something on the floor, but it could have got her probably before. But in any case, I really like too that when she gets away from it and she closes the doorway, it doesn't turn back into real floor right away they're shaking and you can hear shrieking and like the furniture shakes for a second as if it's like pounding on the ceiling um so yeah that jesus christ like that ugh, that was rough the symbolism of it combined with the uh the just repulsiveness of the thing um now, her decision to eat the grapes results in the death of two of the fairies because this thing just bites their heads right the fuck off. And when she winds up having to give the satchel that was loaned to her by Pan that had the fairies in it back, he sees that she did not follow his very simple instructions and is rightfully super angry at her and decides that she must not be the one that they want after all, and that she's going to remain immortal forever and that their world will slowly disappear. Thanks a lot. You dumbass. I sympathize, Pam, frankly, you're right. Um, but again, fairy tales have to work out a certain way. They just really do. Like if you do follow the instructions right from the beginning, like I said, you don't get to see what happens. You have to know what the consequences are, you know, you can know in your vague way, well, obviously you have to listen to the old witch who said to do this thing, because if you don't, something bad will happen. But you need to know what that is. You know, like, that's just the story. So, um, so like, this is all kind of going on. Uh, like, her being abandoned by Pan is happening as her mother tosses this mandrake onto the fire 
and goes into labor, a bad labor. And so she's feeling completely abandoned by this like alternate reality fantasy world. And she's also feeling abandoned by her mother. Um, and it's really, there's a sad scene where she's like talking to the little brother that she believes is in her mom's belly and telling him like, I'll make a deal with you. If you come out and you don't hurt her, I'll make you a prince in the underworld. Spoiler, because the mandrake's dead and maybe not because, but it feels this way because of the story. Her mother does successfully give birth to a baby boy, but she dies leaving Ophelia to the tender mercies of her sadistic fucking father. Um, I, oh, I feel the girl, the little girl who plays Ophelia is amazing. Like, I don't know where they found her. I know that the woman who plays Mercedes, she was in Itu Mama Tambien, which was a really good movie. If you haven't seen, um, highly recommended. It's a, it has a kind of a weird ending, but also feels very true. I do not recognize anybody else in this movie. Um, I know that the captain was in other stuff. He's vaguely familiar, but I don't know what. And other than the two of them, I recognize not a soul. Um, and this little girl is really convincing in the scene where she's begging for the baby to not hurt her mom, in the scenes where she is scared of her stepfather, in the scenes where she's just like trying to get by unnoticed. You know, there's like a certain amount of that when you're living in an abusive situation of just trying to not be seen so that you don't draw attention and harm onto yourself. Um, so as all of this is happening, there's like the subplot of Mercedes and the doctor who are working with the people in the woods, the rebels. And I figured that I thought that the captain was going to cotton on to what was going on sooner than he did. Um, he winds up realizing that the antibiotics in the doctor's satchel are from, are the same as the ones that he found abandoned by the fire in the woods after they raided one of the rebel camps. And he had already captured one of the rebels and broken every single one of the kid's fingers. I think pulled all of his teeth out. Like, Oh, this is the stuff I was afraid of. We don't have to see it happen. We just see the aftermath, which is plenty bad enough. And the doctor kills the poor torture, torture victim. And, had been ordered to save him, to keep him alive, um, to treat him so that he could be subjected to another round of torture, which, frankly, I can't imagine being in the position this doctor's in. Like, I just be being brought in so that you can treat someone who's undergone torture just to extend their torturableness is a living nightmare. And I really appreciated that this was where he drew the line. He was willing to cover up that he disagreed with the captain on many issues and try to be diplomatic. But right here, no, he's not doing this anymore. So he injects the kid with something that kills him. And I adored this reaction. So I'm going to get into something that's a little bit personal here, but is... It feels very related to me. Um, the reaction that the captain has here is not, oh, so you betrayed me. That's not the words that he uses to, to what he says is, why did you disobey me? I don't understand. I told you what to do. Why didn't you obey me and do what I told you to do? That's the way that he says it. And, I believe I've talked on other shows. My father uh, was from Colombia and he was part of the guerrilla forces when he was young. And he wound up defecting and fleeing to the United States after seeing some of their tactics. 
And some of those tactics included torture. And there was one particular officer who would orgasm while torturing people. It was one of the things that like haunted my dad. Um, and despite my father not subscribing to this whole method of doing things, despite the fact that he would, that he fled and couldn't return to his home country for many years because they knew who he was and they were waiting for him. He still maintained a stolid soldier like belief in obedience. And while he did eventually defect, I believe that he participated in some shit that he couldn't shake. That was part of why he became a born again, because he felt he needed to atone for some shit. And I think about that kind of thing frequently. What, where do you draw the line when you initially got into something because you believed in it? And it starts to spin out of control. How do you know when enough is enough and when to stop? And I don't know how long after, you know, associating with this torturer that he knew he decided to bounce. He may have been working with that guy for a couple of years before he left. But that obedience ran so deep that he was with them for a long time before he finally fled. And that was something that I am not, I am a questioner. That is who I am. And that's why I do what I do now. I am somebody who goes, yeah, but why, why do we do this? Why do we ask this? Why did that happen? Why did they decide to go this way with it? And my father really did not like that about me. It was something he had a serious problem with because he saw it as disrespectful. So we got in a lot of fights and I'm getting like emotional right now because he would ask me to obey him because he believed that he deserved that. He was my father. He provided for me. And if he told me to do something, if I loved him at all, I should listen. The end of the story. And so this moment where he says, why didn't you obey me? Why didn't you just, I told you what to do. And like, he seems genuinely mystified here, even though he knows the guy is betraying him, even though he's aware the dude is a, is a spy, essentially. There's something so real and sincere about him asking that question, because he doesn't get how you could be given an order and not listen. What does not compute? And so that like got me really hard in the guts when I saw this scene, because when the doctor says being given an order may be enough for you, maybe somebody just tells you what to do and you just do it. And that's all you need. That's not how I am. And it's a frightening thing to like see something that you understand so deeply writ large in this like life or death situation. Do you know what I mean? Like this conversation is some is one that I could have had with my father if I had known how to give voice to how I felt. Because he would ask me to do things that didn't make sense to me. And all I wanted to know was why he wanted me to do this this way when this other way made much more sense to me seemed more efficient to me. Why? I don't under and he would get so angry at just me asking why. And so this like, I don't know, there was just something about this scene that like really hit home to me. And I was, to be honest, pleasantly surprised that all the doctor gets is a shot in the back as he's walking away. I really thought he was about to be pulled back in there and have his teeth yanked out. But thankfully, the doctor is like aware, I think, that he's going to die. Either he's not walking out of there alive, or he at least isn't going to finish his day alive. He may go home and they'll find him like God knows. But he's walking out of the barn and they shoot him. And I was like, 
you know what? I guess that's the best you could probably ask for at this point. And that's a lot of this movie is like being shot is kind of the best you can hope for because the other alternatives are so terrible. Um, so yeah, that was that scene. Um, and the fact that he figures out the doctor was betraying him leads to him understanding that Mercedes is the informant and he, it's so good. She's telling him as he ties her up in the barn, getting ready to torture her, tells him you keep underestimating women. You just don't understand that, you know, just because we're feminine and maternal and caring and in some cases soft hearted, that we are also tough as fucking nails and really sly and have to keep our wits about us because we're always subjected to this garbage from you. So she's trying to warn him in a way and he's not hearing it. All he says is like, well, you did figure out my weakness which she did, and yet you still haven't. And it turns out that this little knife that she keeps like wrapping up in her apron, I don't know if this is supposed to be just like a little kitchen habit that she has because the women in the kitchen know that she does this. They watch her do it a couple times and nobody says anything. So I'm not entirely sure how aware they are are of the danger that she's in do they know she's an informant like how many people are but in any case she uses it to cut her bonds and then come after him here goes the number one problem i have with this movie which is the fact that she doesn't kill him it just doesn't make any sense i'm sorry like even if i try and be like well in a fairy tale it has this isn't the fairy tale this is real life this bitch had this psychopath at her mercy kill the motherfucker what is wrong with you what is wrong with you she stabs him in a few different places never in the heart she cuts his face open and then she tries to just run away on foot when they know that she's not meant to be let go what are you doing i don't understand like Maybe she couldn't have gotten away if she had killed him. I don't buy that she would have had a worse chance getting away after having murdered him. Then if anything, she would have had a better chance because the only reason that they wind up chasing her is because he comes running out of the barn, bleeding, saying for them to follow her. Otherwise, they were all just looking at her like, that's weird. He just let her go, but they didn't know what to do. So they're watching her leave. And then this guy comes running out. But if she'd killed him, he wouldn't have. And they would all have just been like, I don't understand. And then they would have gone into the barn and realized what happened, but she would have at least gotten some extra time. So this infuriated me to the point where it was hard for me to uh, like appreciate the rest of the movie because it doesn't, it just doesn't make any sense to me. Like, um, yeah, I don't know, but Oh no, Chris is saying, did the feed end for other people? I hope not guys. I'm still here. It still says it's running. Um, So yeah, this is like the end, the climactic ending to this movie, because what winds up happening for um, Ophelia is that Pan comes to her and tells her to bring her baby brother down into the labyrinth. And of course, like he says this and I'm just like, oh, what now? Like figuring is Pan going to eat a baby? What's and she has to steal the baby from her stepfather. And this results in this like really tense scene. He stitches his face. Oh, guys, I can't handle that scene. I'm not even going to talk about it, frankly. Um, But she has to steal the baby. And he sees her and tries to, but she has already drugged his drink. Apparently not enough because he's still able to chase her. But it's like, not a uh he's not completely with it he's stumbling and having trouble staying upright so it had an effect it just didn't kill him which i think is what we were all hoping for so he's chasing her into the labyrinth and it's very like um what's the word i want it feels very minotaur in the labyrinth kind of thing because he's just like this panting monster with his face sliced open 
and is really not even like coming after her for like revenge. He wants his son back and she, God knows what she's going to do with him. I'm wondering if he thinks that she's crazy because once he finally catches up with her in the center of the maze, she's talking to Pan from our perspective. But when we jump to his perspective, it looks like she's just talking to the air. There's nothing there. So he catches up with her and Pan has just told her that he needs to uh, spill some drops of her, her little brother's blood in order to open the portal. Okay, so here's my next problem. He says we need to spill the blood of an innocent. And immediately, I'm like, how is she not an innocent? Of course she's an innocent. Spill her blood. What are you doing? I didn't, like, that was my first thought was just, why the baby? She's an innocent. She's a child. Yeah, use her. It's fine. And then when he's like, well, we just need a couple of drops, which... I can understand her like not necessarily believing that, but also like then ask for the knife and do it yourself. And if he like really means it, then he wouldn't care if you did that. Um, There were just like, and I know that I can't get hung up on this kind of thing when it's like fairy tale thing. I get that, but still it bothered me. (laughs) Um, So in the end, she decides that she doesn't believe Pan that it's just going to be a couple drops. It does not occur to her that she herself is innocent. So her blood isn't even like a question. And but see, Melanie's saying the blood is a task. Will she sacrifice a baby to get what she wants? But that's the thing. She's not being asked to sacrifice a baby. She's believing that's probably what it actually means. That's not what she's being told is going to happen. And that for me muddies it a little bit. If they told her straight up no we have to kill the baby that'd be one thing but he's like we just need a couple drops of blood and it turns out that he's not lying just her drops that are coming off her hand are enough to open the portal um but and Devin says she's being asked to harm him even if it is just a little bit and okay like i get but it's just not i get the theory and i understand like in fairy tale speak that that's but it's just frustrating for me um, so she says that she would not let the baby, you know, take on, to be harmed at all on her behalf. Pan asks if she would be willing to sacrifice herself for the sake of this brat who she doesn't even know and, you know, isn't even like really her whole brother. And she says, yes. And Pan says, so be it. And then disappears and she turns around and her stepfather's there. And he comes forward and takes his son out of her arms and then shoots her. And I think I, I wasn't, I'm, I'm, I wasn't spoiled on any parts of this movie, but I did think that she died at the end. Nobody spoiled me on that, but I had a feeling that's how it was going to go. Um, nevertheless, though, I was very surprised that this was how she died because him shooting her is a whole other thing. Like that's fucked up. That's fucked up. I hate that he like kind of won for a second there, even though not in the end, but still for a moment he did. And he leaves with the baby. But by the time he gets out of the labyrinth, there's like all of the rebels are outside and they have taken the place over. And one of the things that, Uh, Mercedes had said to him when she had the knife in his mouth was, if you touch the little girl, I will kill you. And she takes the son from him and they shoot him. And it's a great moment because he's like, tell my son that the time that I died, tell my son that I said, and she says, no, he won't even know your name. And he looks like nothing has ever frightened him more the fact that he hung everything on this son. He didn't care if if his wife lived or died. He told the doctor, if you have to choose, choose the baby. That's what he cared about. And now the baby is going to move on and not even know who its father was. Pretty good punishment. Pretty boss, to be honest. 
Um, and she, uh, in the center of the labyrinth, Ophelia is bleeding into the ceremonial spot that opens the portal. And we have all of the rebels like filing into the labyrinth and standing around her body. And uh, Mercedes falls at her knees next to her and is sobbing. And then the camera sort of flares. And we are in this huge hall with her mother and what I presume is her father. Like he's the king in this world. But, you know, we saw her mother in her real life and the the queen in this world looks just like her mother did. Um, we never saw her father, but I'm assuming that he looks like her father did in the real world also. So that it's sort of like returning to them. Um, and they're saying that the final task was for her to be willing to sacrifice herself. And they welcome her home. And that's the end. Not a big fan of the ending. Um, I like what what he's doing here in terms of like the mirroring of her fantasy world with like trying to make sense of the real world and using it as a retreat and a, uh, the legend of it being like a promise of escape from all of this. I even like that it's as cruel a world in the fantasy world as it is in this world. But the ending, I just don't really know what I think. Like, it wasn't quite satisfying to me, but I can't tell you what would have been. Um, I just feel like um, Melanie says, my thoughts of the ending is that it didn't actually happen. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of how I took it, is that like, it's just symbolic of her going to heaven and being with her parents who are dead. You know, she died and that death is a sweet release from this fucking purgatory of uh, planet earth. That feels like so simplistic to me that I think that's what bothered me. Um, Krista says, I straight up cried. You're just describing her death again. I'm sorry, Krista. Um, I think, you know what I think it is about this movie that has, that bothers me and it's not really fair considering the subject matter. I think the movie is so unrelentingly bleak that I get fatigue from it. And that like, there's this moment at the end that is meant to sort of be like beautiful, but it feels like it's not real. So it doesn't feel beautiful. It feels mocking to me, if that makes sense. Like, everything is really awful. So I'm going to tell you this like happy ending that really never happened in order to try and make up for the fact that the world is a hellscape and life is pain and we all just long for the sweet release of death. Like, yeah, I think that's what it is. It's just everything from beginning to end was torture and death and misery and fear from, and the, there's only one moment of hope and it's not real. Like, you could say that Mercedes is like a moment of hope in just who she is, that she's still fighting, and that she actually managed to get away. And I'll grant you that, but she's also ends the movie on her knees, sobbing in grief. Not super hopeful. So I think that's what it is. It's like, I, I feel like tragedy is best when it's offset by some some real true beauty. That is how life is, I think. It's like life is 95% hardship and the 5% that isn't is so incredibly beautiful and amazing 
that somehow, even though it's only 5%, it still manages to make up for the 95. Somehow, impossibly, if you're lucky, it does. So they didn't give me that 5%, I think is why this was tough for me. Um, what about the fact that baby brother has that beauty because of the sister's sacrifice? Don't care. The brother doesn't mean anything to me. We don't even see that baby. It's just a bundle of things that they play a crying baby noise when the bundle appears. Like, I think we see the we see him his face briefly when she's looking down at him, holding him in the maze, and has to like make her decision. But I have no connection to babies. That's always been how I am. So, whenever a baby has been like a stand-in for that a, a baby i always feel in stories like this and in movies is like kind of a manipulation tactic we're going to use a baby here so people really are upset or really feel something or really care never has worked on me i don't give a shit about babies so maybe that's just me maybe this movie like in the end doesn't really work for me because i have no maternal instinct is that it i hate to think that that's all it is but um I don't know. I, ah, I'm interested. Like Melanie, do you get what I'm saying about this? Does that make sense to you? Um, because I'm, I'm really struggling to kind of put into words how I'm feeling here. Um, <laughs> Rosalie, I don't give a shit about baby's new mug design. You know what? You're not that far off. But that's why people fight oppression, knowing they'll die for others to benefit. Yeah, and I think that's. Like the the thing for me is if she had sacrificed herself on behalf of somebody that I had a connection with, I that I would have been more moved by. For example, if she sacrificed herself on behalf of Mercedes, that would have felt like something. Mercedes wouldn't have made sense because it's not the like blood of an innocent, but then just change the blood of an innocent thing. Because Mercedes might not be innocent, innocent, but she's a good person. And I care about her and I want somebody to save her. And the idea of Ophelia throwing herself in front of Mercedes when maybe her stepfather was about to kill that woman, that moves me a lot more just in theory talking about it than the baby did in that in the actual movie. Um, I don't really care about the baby either, but I like unknown or what you make of it endings. I see that. The ending is Ophelia choosing her ending, not about the baby for me. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know that Ophelia knew what she was choosing. I like, mm, I have trouble with it just because of the whole w way that it all worked out. So I get what you're saying, but because of how it worked, where like Pan framed it as if it's just a couple drops of blood. And then it turns into, oh, so you'd sacrifice yourself? Well, bitch, who said anything about sacrificing? You said just a couple drops. So here's my hand. Take a couple drops of my blood. And then all of a sudden it's, oh, so you're willing to die? All right, I'm going to disappear. Now you're going to be shot by your psychotic stepfather. Like, mm, mm, I don't know. Yeah, I'm sorry, guys. That's my, that's my, like, now that I've talked about it, I'm kind of coming down on that is that, I think this movie works for me for about like 75%. And then the ending kind of undid some stuff for me because I just got so angry, mostly because the ending doesn't work unless Ophelia or no, unless Mercedes doesn't kill him. And the fact that she doesn't kill him makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. It just doesn't make any fucking sense. You can try and convince me all you want, but in real life, a real Mercedes would have really killed the captain. And that's all there is to it. Because there's no way you just like hurt a man like that and then just try and run on foot through the woods. That's just not what. Ugh. So the fact that the way everything went down sort of hinged on her making that inexplicable decision just like drives me banana pants. But... That's that's how I am. I think earlier uh, Devin said that um, there's a book I've read where the angel and devil sitting on the main character's shoulders are Kirk and Spock. You have, you've got a Spock. 
I think that's the problem. Yeah. Um, Because like I said, I was totally willing to let go. She ate the grapes. Is it stupid to eat the grapes when you've been told not to? Yes. But that's fairy tales. That's how they go. This is like in in a fairy tale, Mercedes would have killed him too. You know, like she most definitely would have. She wouldn't even have just killed him. Mercedes would have like cut off his head and then brought the head to like the president and the president would have like uh, married her and she would have lived happily ever after as like the queen of Spain or something um, is how that would have gone in a fairy tale. But it's fine. <laughs> Rosalie, I like this fanfic. I did like the 75% and like um, it's really it's funny because like it's one of those movies, like I said, that I've been wanting to check out. And I was like, I don't know. There's something about it that makes me think this isn't going to be for me. And I think my my suspicions were mostly right in terms of like what I thought was coming in a lot of it, um, which is kind of rare for me. I'm used to my expectations like being turned on their head. But and and it's weird that I kind of felt that way despite not being spoiled on it at all. But um, like I said, the creature stuff is amazing. The acting is really good. Even like the script is really good. Um, a lot of it anyway, other than, you know, the last portion. And I can totally understand why people love this movie. I really get it. It's just I the way that my brain works, it frustrates me. But I'm I can really be rational to the point of like being infuriating. So you know that you guys, you all listen to the other shows. <laughs> I never thought like as a kid who was ex- extremely imaginative and like, you know, colored outside the lines, as they say, I never thought that I would ever be the person that people would accuse of being too rational. But that's what I've turned into. I guess a lot of us don't see that kind of thing coming as kids. We don't think we're going to grow up to be that one. Um, do you all have any other questions that you want to ask me about this? Because uh, I'm going to be wrapping up in a moment and going and watching the second episode of season two of Westworld and then uh, recording that busy day. Damn. And then I have tomorrow during the day, I have the book club, which is covering Dead Zone by Stephen King. And I'm doing that one with Alan. That's at 2 p.m. Central Time for those who want to come. And uh, in the evening, I'm doing Unsober with Rashawn. And we're going to be talking about pumpkin spice and whether it will be the great unifier that will end racism. Um, who is your favorite character or creature? Who? Um, my favorite character. Ah. Uh, you know, it's an interesting thing because I want to say Mercedes because, you know, she's strong and she really, like, pulled it out at the end despite not killing him. Like, she's still badass. There's something fascinating to me, though, about Ophelia's mother because of, like, the impossible position that she's in and my curiosity about how everything went down between her and the captain when she met him, like – wondering whether this was entirely voluntary her marriage to him or if it was just the only way that she could see out of a terrible situation in order to like take care of her daughter there's something about that that's like that's low-key heroic about a woman doing something that straight up dangerous like being this guy's wife is dangerous and doing that because she's, like, she's trying to get herself and her daughter safe. You know, she's kind of sacrificing her own safety and yes, potentially the safety of her daughter, but also like you have to make these impossible decisions sometimes. So there's something about her that really interests me. Um, so yeah, I would put the two of them kind of on par with each other. Um, creature. I'm not sure. I'm trying to think how many different... I mean, it's got to be the pale man, right? Like, he's just so insane looking and so repugnant. Like, how do you even think of... It's not just the fact that his eyes are in his hands. I also like the tips of his fingers are red with blood, but at the very tips, black as if they're starting to rot or were burned. His flesh is like hanging like flabby off his body 
and he's like bow legged. There's so much happening with the design of that creature that's fucking freaky when it's put together that it's got to be him. Like, yikes. Um, did I miss you talking about a bunch of people who choose to lisp, make fun of a dude who stutters? Um, no, you didn't, because I didn't really talk about that. I kind of skated over that dude in general, because he is the one that gets captured and tortured. Um, but no, I mean, it's shitty, but like in the grand scheme of this movie, it's very, very bottom rung for me, Krista. I'm sorry. Him getting tortured literally is taking precedence over people making fun of him earlier in the movie, despite their being his friends. Friends in quotes. Allies is more of the appropriate word, I guess. Um, yeah. Poor kid. It bugged me before he was tortured. I just like, yeah, I was not like even thinking on that level while I was watching that scene. Like, was it annoying? Like, I was like, oh, come on, give the guy a break. And that was about as much thought as I left it with because there was so much going on. I mean, two seconds later, they're sawing a guy's leg off. So, yeah, that got back burnered real quick. <laughs> That sawing scene, too. Like, they give you one deep dig of the saw into his leg before they cut, and it was I was just about to hit the ceiling. I was so tense throughout this whole movie, and, like, thank God Owen was home because he almost didn't get home in time to watch it with me, and I was telling uh, Melanie that, like, I might have to go on Twitter and live tweet in order to, like, keep myself company because I'm not going to make it through. And after having seen it, I don't know what I would have done done if he hadn't come home I would have been a disaster I would have been a disaster like just forget it I'm so glad that he was home god bless he was home and we got pizza so that helped also pizza is just a giant warm comfy blanket <sighs> he got to watch it with you oh in comfort yes indeed although at one point I was like pulling on his sleeve because he was on the whole other end of the couch and somebody was about to get tortured. And he was like, what? And I was like, I need you. Get over here. Like I had to yell at him. <laughs> and then he sort of realized, oh, yeah, that's what I'm here for. I forgot. Um, but yeah, so it's definitely like I really recommend seeing the movie. I'm just really curious what people's like takeaways are going to be and whether because I, I sort of took it for granted that we all assumed the ending didn't really happen. And now that Melanie has like pointed it out, I'm realizing maybe people do think that the whole like fantasy element was real and they they take it literally like it, the whole thing was an actual fairy tale that we were you know presented with and we saw the actual ending of it. Um, but the way that the ending was filmed, the color scheme, the the lighting, the camera work was so over the top that it just it didn't feel like the rest of the movie, which is why it didn't feel real to me was that it just was it felt like the directorial choice directorial choices were purposely made to set it apart from the entire rest of the film on purpose. Um and Rosalie says it's the kind of movie I only watched once and I'm fine with that. I totally know what you mean. That's actually kind of the way that I described Black Mirror to somebody today. I think I was talking to Jamie and uh, I was saying that there are some episodes of that show that fucked me up so deeply. I will never watch them again, but I'm glad I saw them. Like they were amazing, brilliant episodes of television, but holy shit, I will never put myself through that again. Um. I wanted it to be what Ophelia believed as she died so she could be happy. Okay. So it's not just something that, that he did for the audience. It's something that Ophelia did. Hmm. Okay. Interesting. Well, that's even sadder. Well, now I don't know if I like that or not better. Maybe I like that better that she believed it. But that is really sad. But it's like, you know, she was definitely dead by the time we saw that. But still. But see, there's me trying to be too rational about it. Like, whether she was dead when we saw it probably doesn't factor in at all. Like, But I, that's how I'm, like, approaching it, which isn't really right, I think. Um, I sobbed in the theater. I'm sorry, Krista. 
the neurons firing in her brain, right? Her, her seeing the light at the end of the tunnel was the, uh, the incredible throne room. That throne, like, straight up, how do they get onto the thrones? Because they're about 30 feet in the air on these, like, pedestals that are, to my eye, do not have stairs attached. Is there an escalator on the back of those things? I really was looking at that, like, how do you live up there? Does that thing, like, unfold into, like, a bed and you can sleep and you don't have to leave? Um, Seems like more of a curse than a privilege, but okay. And, um, yeah, the everybody, like, applauding her as she comes in was in some ways to me, like, creepier because – I don't know what other creatures are in this world, but I kept picturing like, like pale men's and toads and whatnot, like in the galleries around her being like, oh, yay, she's here. Like, they don't have to be all people. Mm. Um, Dead isn't all at once. You hear for 30 minutes after you're clinically dead. Really? 30 minutes is a long ass time. Um. Krista, as soon as this is over, I'm going to forget you said that. Please never tell me again. Yeah, I think that's fair, Devin. I thought she was in hell. You thought she was in hell and then you realized where she really was? Or you thought she was in hell, like, full stop? That's what you think happened. Um, I'm king of the underworld. No, that seems like hell for her. Huh. She looked happy. Hmm. I mean, King of the Underworld, that's the other thing, Melanie, is that she wants to be Princess of the Underworld. And I was like, you really need to get the fine print on what that means, girl, because she seems a little too excited about something that to me sounds sinister and I would not want to go there. Thank you. Um, Monsters everywhere would be hell for her. Yeah, no, that's kind of what I mean. That's like I felt like the way the color and the light was meant to like present this moment as something triumphant and beautiful and exciting. But I kept having this creeping feeling that like if the camera swung over to the gallery and really showed us who was there, it was going to be a bunch of like horrifying creatures. And she was just going to have to like in this new world live again amongst monsters and figure out how to come to terms with that just like when she was alive in the mortal world which is unfair no rewards for you um which you know maybe that's is that the symbolism that we don't have to have actual monsters that we run away from and escape in the uh in the fantasy world like in the real world, we have them. It's just they look like us. Mm, maybe. Her running away from the um, the pale man is very similar to her running away from her stepfather in the uh, labyrinth. And she just manages to escape through a hole that she opens with magic. Mm, maybe that's what we're... Is that part of it? Interesting. Well, I feel like I've uh, I've exhausted the conversation. Is there anything else that you want to mention, y'all, before I wrap up? Thank you very much to Melanie for commissioning this. I apologize if my reaction to the ending is not what you hoped for. But I'm really glad to have watched it and I wouldn't have done it if somebody hadn't commissioned it. So I'm really glad that... And I just like, guys... I'm sincere and I'm going to make a post about this, but like this month has been really hard because LeakyCon absorbed so much more money than I expected. And I have completely maxed out my credit card for work. And I would have been, uh, I don't know what I would have done the past two weeks because I had to go to therapy and that drive is an hour and change and I need to pay for gas and all of this stuff. I kept being like, I don't know what I'm going to do. And then I'd get a commission. And then I'd get another one. And it happened like I would be like, God, I'm going to need about $70 for this day because I'm going to have to pay for gas twice and I need to get a couple. And then I would get three commissions and $75, boom, in my bank account. Like I was at $5 and y'all saved me. I mean, saved with a capital S. It was uncanny how many times it happened. 
So I just deeply un- appreciate all of you who have been commissioning. And I want you to know like how crucial every single but- person's commission has been to keeping me afloat through the end of this month, because I sincerely would have had to not leave the house for the last two weeks, if not for y'all. Um, so, and I just never expected it to be this successful so soon. I'm hoping it sustains itself, but, uh, I'm just really happy with it that not only am I like getting paid and like, you know, financially feeling like I'm a little safe, which is not something I feel usually, but also everything that is being commissioned is really good. So it's just been a pleasure to do all this reading. And like, I'm super busy and doing back to back stuff. Yes. But I'm talking about stuff that I want to talk about. And that's a great feeling. Like, that's what you want, right? For work, like doesn't get better than that. Um, it's not a one-to-one comparison, but with the pale man frescoes, I was reminded of Satan eating his son painting so much imagery on imagery in this moving. Oh, you, yeah. Is it, is it Saturn eating? Is that the one or, that you're talking about? Or is it Satan? I'm thinking of one that was by, is it Goya? They're the, uh, Spanish painters and Italian painters. They were real good with like beautiful but dark and upsetting stuff catholicism is rife with that too specifically um i had some trouble with some of that artwork that my abuela had in her house that i was like okay i see that you would find this beautiful but also deeply disturbing and i don't understand why you have this hanging in your house um but yeah i totally see what you mean all right well guys thank you all so much i really appreciate y'all um, if you're interested in, in commissioning something, it's unspoiledpodcast.com slash shop. Uh, the group is at facebook.com slash groups slash spoil me pod. And um, there is a document pinned to the top of the group that tells you what has been commissioned and uh, what remains to be seen. So you can, you know, work with people on that. Um, and I think that's everything. All right, guys. Well, thank you all so much. And I will see you on Monday. Um, I have the next 50 pages of Fire and Hemlock. I have the next five chapters of Iron Druid. And I think there was one more thing. Let me just double check here. Um, but yeah, Monday is going to be a busy day for me. So, and it's Labor Day. So I'm hoping that people will be able to come to that, um, because they will be off of work. Uh, let's see. Oh yeah. And then I have Sunshine at 5 p.m. Um, on Monday. So it's 11 and 12 and then 5 p.m. for those. And you can find all those events at facebook.com slash unspoiled pod slash events or at unspoiledpodcast.com slash events. Um, So yeah. All right, guys, I will see you on Monday or if you want to come to the book club tomorrow. And until then, toodaloo, motherfuckers. Spoiled Network Podcast.